Thank you very much, Soye, and also thanks a lot to the organizers, both for setting up this uh, meeting and for giving me the opportunity to speak here. So uh, the work I'm going to speak about is joint work with Philip Harms and Stefan Sommer. And uh, it's just been published in the bulletin of the LMS. Um, it's a paper with exactly the same title as the talk. And uh, broadly speaking, what the project is about is that there is a family of stochastic processes which are uh, both of interest and actually used in uh, shape analysis. And uh, for some reasons, which I'm going to uh, give an example later on, uh, one is, is interested if this stochastic process exists for all times, meaning that maybe there wouldn't be a positive probability of this process hitting some sort of uh, boundary in finite time. And as you may see from the title, uh, we are still far away from actually solving it in the full general setting. Um, but uh, because, uh, as far as we are aware, this is kind of the first result about stochastic completeness uh, for these set of processes, and because the results already do give some nice indications, uh, we thought we, we put it out. And what I'm going to start off with is just give you a bit more of a motivation. So what, pro uh, what are the problems you may care about? Um, so, for instance, if you've got a phylogenetic trees, um, for instance, of butterfly wing shapes, that's kind of the canonical example, then uh, you may be in the situation where you have like two butterfly wing shapes. You know that one kind of evolved into the other over time, and you want to understand how this evolution has happened. And then, because it's nature, it doesn't necessarily evolve according to geodesics, and you have some noise input into this. So you may want to model this as a kind of stochastic evolution. And what you then care about at the end of the day is kind of a stochastic bridge process. So you know it sort of evolves according to the stochastic process. You know the starting point and you know the end point. And now the one thing I should highlight is if you like, just on the theoretical level, care about stochastic processes or stochastic bridges, you don't need your underlying stochastic process to actually exist for all times. You can kind of um, use a disintegration of measure uh, technique where it just works without having this global existence. But basically all existing um, simulations for diffusion bridges assume that your underlying process exists for all times. So that's why it's actually uh, sort of on the theoretical level important to know that these processes exist for all times. Um, and then another motivation uh, which may be there is that if you have MRI scans, um, maybe you have like a family of templates for um, what the MRI scan of a healthy brain looks like. And then again, maybe some templates of MRI scans for brains which may develop Alzheimer. And then you have a new MRI scan and you want to understand is this closer to like a healthy brain or closer to someone who may develop Alzheimer. Um, again, you kind of want to compare shapes or like how one shape evolves into another. Uh, and again, you can add a time component into this if you have like a follow-up um, scan of data over time. And um, you've noticed that with those um, pictures, like technically they're like objects in infinite dimensional spaces, but then very, um, one very successful method is by going for landmarks. So the idea is that instead of dealing with a full picture, we just think of our pictures as being characterized by a collection of landmarks. So the idea is you put like distinctive points um, around your image, which more or less characterize um, the important features you care about um, nicely. And uh, I should highlight here, uh, one crucial assumption is that um, any two landmarks are distinct. And then you sit the situation uh, you may be at is you have like this um, skull and then maybe some biologist put these um, yellow dots somewhere uh, say like this is what they care about and then you think of this skull just as this point cloud of those yellow dots and that's basically how um, your skull is going to be characterized. So at the end of the day what we now care about is um, trying to compare these point clouds. So instead of thinking of pictures, we may have one point cloud and we either want to understand how close this one point cloud is to another point cloud, or we want to understand how maybe this one point cloud can stochastically evolve into the other point clouds. 
So that's essentially the setup. And then you need to understand um, how you can transfer these point clouds into another point cloud. And then a very one very effective mechanism, again, is the large deformation diffeomorphism landmark matching approach, where the idea is that you have one set of points, and um, if you now apply a diffeomorphism to your space RD, um, you want to evolve this, or like a family of diffeomorphisms, you want to evolve this into your target um, point cloud. And then um, basically the idea is you also have a way of um, characterizing of how smooth you want this evolution to be, this diffeomorphic evolution, um, which um, in this case you can either characterize by an operator L, um, or another way is that you link it uh, to a suitable norm, um, which is here, um, where you basically now have a time-dependent vector field, which through this flow equation um, down here is going to give you a flow of diffeomorphisms, with the idea being that you start in one uh, point cloud, which is like characterizing one image at the end of the day, then through this flow of diffeomorphisms over time, it's going to give you the target point cloud, which essentially is the target picture you care about. And um, if you then go for this minimization, um, this can then, at the end of the day, give you a sort of notion of distance. Uh, because if you find um, whatever time-dependent vector field minimizes this uh, problem, then you can think of this as being like the optimal way of transferring from one point cloud to another point cloud. Okay, so keep in mind here the idea of the picture is we have these n landmarks in our D space and we move them through a flow of diffeomorphisms to another um, sort of collection of n points in the RD space. And now there's actually another characterization of exactly the same setting um, where we will use a kernel K. And I should highlight that the kernel K is linked to this norm which we use to measure like the smoothness of the um, diffeomorphism flow. And uh, it arises by just looking at a suitable reproducing kernel um, for this um, inner product induced by polarization from this norm. Um, don't worry too much about the details, just think about the fact that uh, we started off with some norm and sort of measure smoothness of our transformation, and this norm gives rise to some kernel which uh, takes, at the end of the day, two landmarks as an input and puts out a d by d matrix. That's in a canonical way, is linked to your norm. And then there's a way that so, so far, a picture was like this collection of n landmarks in the RD space. And now we change tack a bit and think of this collection as actually one point in a much bigger space. So we now have an open subset of R n times D, and one collection of points is just one point in this big Euclidean space. And the one thing I should highlight, because it's going to become important later, is that's actually not the full Euclidean space, because we have this one restriction that we don't want landmarks to coincide. So basically, you take out a number of fat diagonals. So every, every like pair or like every tuple of points where any two points um, coincide, you take those out. And that gives you like an additional boundary to the space which we have to worry about. Okay, and then it turns out that you'll actually be able to endow this open subset of R n times D with a Riemannian metric so that if you now care about the distance from one point cloud, which is one point, to another point cloud, which is another point in that big space, by just solving a geodesic boundary value problem. So that's just um, written here. That, um, so this Q is going to be our landmark space and I'll tell you in a moment how we can construct a Romanian, construct a Romanian metric um, so that this um, minimizer U you had previously, which gave you diffeomorphism, now actually projects down to a geodesic. Because um, with the original picture with the diffeomorphisms 
phi of t applied to the original point cloud is some other point cloud, which again is a point in our space Q, so you can think of this projecting down to a path from your initial point to your target point. Okay, now what I still need to tell you is how you actually construct this metric G. And here is um, why we care about the kernel, because you can actually um, describe the co-metric being like the inverse of the metric quite nicely in terms of this kernel. And it's just this expression where you think of Xi and eta, it's basically, you have the component of the first landmark, then you have the component of the second landmark, and so on. And, um, sorry, you uh, basically, this Xi i is something which lives in Rd, because the i and j basically run through the number of landmarks. And then as I said, this K was giving you D, D, T, D times D matrix, so this all makes sense. Okay, and then uh, what I should highlight is that actually the analysis we're going to proceed with just uh, solely relies on this expression where you link the co-metric with the kernel. Um, essentially, if you want to, you can forget about it arising from this like LMDMM uh, mechanism because we only need this expression. Okay, um, so, what the next thing is, what I'm going to tell you about, is we actually put a few extra conditions on this kernel, um, which are actually quite natural. Um, so we will assume that they are um, invariant under rotation, and as well, as well as uh, invariant under translations, and this assumption is actually satisfied uh, for most important um, examples. Um, and it means um, we're basically going to consider positive definite kernels uh, such that this K I spoke about earlier actually has the fact, uh, the, the form that any landmarks are going to be mapped to K times their norm in the RD space times the identity matrix in RD, um, where K is some suitable scalar functions. So now, in a way, we reduce the analysis even further. Um, it'll be now down to an analysis of this scalar function K and essentially it depends on uh, the distance between any two landmarks in your space. Okay, and um, two or oh, three examples actually, if you want to have them at the back of your head, um, for which we have some nice pictures at the end. Um, so they kind of, the first two kernels uh, arise from a, a suitable Sobolev kernel, and then this is just uh, the Gaussian kernel. And something I'll highlight now, because it's going to become important later, if you look at the Taylor expansion of these kernels, you see that the second and third one, um, the sort of highest non-constant uh, exponent, uh, or the leading order one which is not constant, behaves like R squared. Whereas for the first one, you have just an R appearing in here. And this actually is going to turn out to qualitatively change the behavior of the underlying stochastic process. Okay, so um, now we care about the stochastic process side. And um, as you may have noticed, I've not really um, said much about this yet. Um, but the idea is we now set up a Riemannian manifold. So we have our uh, space um, where the landmarks can live in. We've got this uh, Riemannian metric, which is linked to the kernel. And the moment you have a Riemannian manifold, there's a very canonical stochastic process on that Riemannian manifold, which is just, you say that it's, uh, its generator is one half of the Laplace Bertrami operator. It's a very canonical thing, and um, it's sort of the first one you may want to go to if you now, instead of going for how do you move along geodesics from one uh, configuration of landmarks to another configuration landmarks, instead we now care about sort of stochastically moving, uh, and we will move according to this Brownian motion on this space. And um, the reason why um, the analysis becomes significantly easier when we just look at two landmarks. So now this was the general setup and we're now moving to exactly what we were able to prove. Obviously at the end of the day, it would be really nice to have a result that um, consider any number of landmarks, uh, put a conditions on your kernels, 
when does the uh, underlying Brownian motion exist for all times and when does it not? Uh, what we have been able to do is to say exactly what happens if we now in the setting where we only have two landmarks. So the RD space is still general, so D can be anything bigger than or equal to one, but now N is just restricted to two. And the reason why it's so much nicer to just look at two landmarks is that actually, um, so in this landmark space, there are more or less two ways which can prevent you from the stochastic process uh, existing for all times. One is running off to infinity in your big Euclidean space. And the other option is that uh, landmarks co collide. That's the other way we, um, how you can fail to have stochastic completeness. And um, if you're now in the setting of just two landmarks, you um, actually know that their distance process, so the distance between the two landmarks, is going to behave as a one-dimensional diffusion process with a singularity at zero, which exactly corresponds to them colliding. And for one-dimensional diffusion processes, there's a very well-developed theory of like analyzing those singularities. So when do they collide? When do they not collide? And this is actually why it's so nice for two landmarks, because the moment you have three landmarks, um, you kind of had the, for instance, have the problem that you can still um, get a Markov process by looking at all the possible distances, but then you don't have this nice black box argument because you're in a higher dimensional setting of when they like get close to zero. And on the other hand, it doesn't seem to be easy to come up with a one dimensional diffusion process which characterizes when any of the uh, three landmarks collide. Okay, and um, um, so this is basically this remark, um, why the analysis for two landmarks is so much nicer and uh, provide a bit of the details. In this particular case, our space Q is just a pair of points X and Y in RD, where X is different from Y. Um, you can write down um, this capital kernel K. Um, it's basically going to give you like K0 block Id uh, identity matrix and K0 block identity matrix um, on either side. Um, and then on the off-diagonal ones, you have um, K evaluated at the distance of the two landmarks. And now this capital K evaluated at Q is basically all the possible D times D matrices you have just thrown together in a bigger, ma a bigger matrix. So this is like K, XX, K, XY, K, XY, and K, Y just um, put together in this matrix, which is why this is just the K of Q. Okay, and uh, for that um, setting, as I said, you can show that RT, which is just the distance between X and Y, um, evolves according to a one-dimensional diffusion process. Uh, so it's scalar, and uh, you can write down um, the so-called diffusivity and the drift quite nicely. And maybe what I can highlight here is that um, there's like a brute force argument where you just sort of write down the SDE satisfied by the Brownian motion, um, then look at the distance function, apply um, Eta's formula and Eta's isometry multiple times, and you get at that expression, and you need to use a lot of stochastic analysis. Um, but there's actually a slightly nicer approach where if you just work in a very nice coordinate system, then this more or less just falls out. Um, so it's a nice situation where you like, if you look at it geometrically in a nice way, you can kill a lot of the stochastic analysis to get to the same result. And um, now the result um, with Philip and Stefan um, is um, as follows. So as I said, we have this space Q, which is the landmark manifold, um, but just for two landmarks. Then um, there are a lot of conditioning, conditions here, and I say something about them now. Um, so the analysis about this one-dimensional diffusion process, um, that can only deal with when can two landmarks collide. For this full uh, long time existence, we still need to rule out the fact that maybe one of the landmarks or two of the landmarks can run off to infinity. But um, there's also a very nice argument where you can show, or we were able to show, that um, you cannot run off to infinity um, unless you've collided. 
Um, so because before you've collided, things are going to be nice and Lipschitz enough that you cannot run off to infinity in finite time. So basically, whenever you rule out collision of landmarks, you then, by the other, other argument, also rule out one off to infinity in finite time. Um, but yeah, just to highlight that you do need a few other conditions to be able to deduce that running off to infinity. Okay, and then um, we make uh, this assumption where this gamma is going to be important. So uh, for the three examples I had written down earlier, we had gamma equal to one for the first sybil of kernel, and then gamma equal to two for the other sybil of kernel and the Gaussian kernel. And what we can show is that this Riemannian manifold is Brownian complete, meaning um, the underlying Brownian motion exists for all times. If gamma is uh, bigger than or equal to two, so notably we can also deal with the equal case, and it's Brownian incomplete if gamma is less than, strictly less than two, where this means there is some positive probability that we can hit a boundary in finite time. And then the proof, um, as I said, there is a, a classification of singularities for map one dimensional diffusion processes. And there's basically a very nice chain um, of our, like a tree, you just go down and then eventually you find out that for gamma equal, uh, or bigger than or equal to two, you have Brownian incompleteness. And for that, you have some possibility of uh, hitting the boundary in finite time. Okay, and um, a few uh, numerical simulations, which essentially back up the theoretical results. Um, so um, this, first of all, is in dimension two, uh, in dimension one for two landmarks. So this is really the setting, we are just on a line. We have two landmarks and um, they uh, evolve according to this uh, Brownian motion, um, where essentially you need to think of two landmarks. This pair is now a point in R2, um, and the one uh, line you're not allowed to hit is just the two diagonal. And um, then, um, so this corresponds to the K1 half kernel, this corresponds to the K a three half kernel, and this corresponds to the Gaussian kernel, um, with uh, this being the uh, logarithm of the distance um, along here. And then this is actually uh, the path of the landmarks plotted for the one uh, path up here, which attains the uh, smallest interdistance. And uh, what you notice, obviously, there's the one catch that with numerical simulations, you do have to be a bit careful to really uh, make a deduction because the question is, with your machine precision, when do you decide that something has actually collided as opposed to being just close, as in very close. Um, but for the first kernel, you do see that it kind of does shoot down uh, quite clearly. So uh, this seems to be in line with them colliding. Uh, and then you actually see here, so this corresponds to the path which sort of shoots down first. Uh, this is how the two landmarks evolve, and they really seem to um, collide um, within finite time. Uh, and then here, uh, you still get quite close, uh, or quite low, uh, when you plot the log of the um, interdistance, but you never have this shooting down thing. And for that kernel, you really don't actually expect that they um, would collide, and then for the picture, they do seem to get very close, but on the level of machine precision, they never seem to be like too close um, that we could still like, uh, or like we were still able to distinguish them well enough. And then here it's actually much clearer, you sort of stay away um, from minus infinity. Uh, and at the end, they get quite close, but again, uh, not very close. And um, then also to plot this for uh, d equals to two. Um, so now it's uh, the same, uh, so it's again the one half kernel, the three half, and the Gaussian kernel here. Um, the distance plotted along here, and now here this plots the different components. So the first component, the second component, and so on. And the one thing you need to be aware of, especially if you see like, um, this picture, um, landmarks uh, or the, the pair of landmarks 
only collides if both components coincide at the same time. So just because um, you have a crossing over here, um, that's still in line with them not colliding, because if you move over from this point over to here, there the other uh, component of the landmark is actually like sufficiently far away. And then um, you have a similar observation. For the first one, you shoot down, and you really seem to collide, uh, whereas for the other ones, you kind of stay far enough away, and it doesn't seem like they actually collide. Um, so it's very nice that, again, it only seems to depend on this gamma in line with our theoretical results, um, whereas the dimension, um, so it doesn't matter on the level of just saying if it's Brownian complete or Brownian incomplete. Um, if you run through the classifications, which I mentioned, you actually see slightly, a slightly different type of singularity in the one-dimensional setting than you see in the higher-dimensional setting. So there, it kind of happens. Um, but yeah, actually, I'm going to finish there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? Yeah, Peter. So I have uh, very naive questions. If, if a Riemannian manifold is geodesically complete, yes. is it also Brownian complete? No, so um, there's sort of, you can find examples for all four settings. Uh, uh -huh. So I think if you, I mean, if you take, for instance, a, just a plane, it's geodesically complete and stochastically complete. If you uh, take a punctured plane, it's ge uh, stochastically complete, but not geodesically complete. Um, so what are the other ones? Then they obviously, if you sort of just take a disk, then this is uh, neither geodesically complete nor stochastically complete. So the one example we are still missing is an example where it's uh, not stochastically complete, but geodesically complete. And there are, um, so there are these cardan hardeman manifolds with like negative curvature. So basically, what you do is you, you space, I think, a sort of negative curvature which blows up, um, but it blows up exactly at the right rate that you don't quite reach infinity if you move like uh, deterministically, but if you have this slight stochastic component added to it, you actually have an option to run away uh, to infinity and in finite time. Um, so there are definitely examples. Um, so you can't just use, I mean, once you have a geodesically complete manifold um, and you can control the volume growth, there are results um, that then that implies stochastic completeness. Is there such a notion as a stochastic completion of a Riemannian manifold? <laughs> I mean, examples. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not even sure if there's a notion. Um, so. I mean, if, if a uh, the question was, uh, no, I mean, but I can repeat the question if needed. So the question was, uh, if I understood correctly, if there's a notion of uh, stochastic completion of a Romanian manifold, uh, and that I'm actually, I mean, I guess there is a way that if you, in general, have a stochastic process which may reach a boundary, it's probably down to the question, how do you continue the stochastic process once it has reached the boundary. So my, I mean, for instance, probably slightly difficult to really make sense of it with when you can run off to infinity, but um, for landmarks, it's actually uh, something worth looking into because then your question boils down to, if two landmarks have hit, how do I continue it? But then, yeah, but then, um, so you will have, an, you can come up with a notion uh, but then the question is probably what kind of boundary conditions do you want to impose? Do you want them to just like ignore each other? Um, shall they bounce off? What angle shall they bounce off? Um, so it's probably going to be like this sort of um, extension for self-adjoint operators. Question B, or not self-adjoint operators, the extension for these operators, how you uh, deal um, with when you hit the boundary. Um, so I guess to that extent you can make sense of, but I don't think anyone ever called it like stochastic completion or something like that. Next question. Is there a link with your sufficient condition and the low bound and the Ricci for 
Stochastic. Um, yeah, actually, thank you for asking that question. I should have uh, said that explicitly. Um, so obviously, there is a criterion um, for stochastic uh, completeness where you just say if your Ricci curvature is lower bounded by anything, you're fine. Uh, there's even a criterion where uh, the Ricci curvature can blow up to minus infinity as long as it doesn't blow up too much. You're still fine. And this has been tried. Uh, so th there have been attempts by just looking at the metric computing the curvature and seeing if any of those criterions apply. And um, A, it gets computationally very difficult because so the co-metric has a very nice expression, but for the curvature you care about the metric and then the terms already look very nasty once you differentiated them twice. So that seems already a bit untractable on that level. Uh, but then it's also been um, computed numerically and it definitely seems like the curvature does blow up, um, so then it would really be um, hard to balance it properly. So to, to say that way, it's been tried. We are fairly sure that the flat lower curvature band does not apply, um, and then really seeing if the suitable blow up bound applies, it's just very hard to see at this stage. So I have a question. <clears throat> so maybe I missed uh Maybe you gave the information at some point, but uh, what about the case where you, you take n larger than two for, yeah? Well, that's uh, still open. Um, so, but what do you think, what's your opinion, and what are, what are numerical simulations telling you? Um, so the numerical simulations, um, there are a few examples where they sort of, if you start off with four, um, so actually in the paper we do have uh, some example, they then sort of, suddenly collide, um, but um, I'm not entirely sure if I really believe this anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit divided, sort of also changing my mind every now and then. I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if you kind of have this link to stochastic, uh, to geodesic completeness. So I'd be kind of tempted now to say that whenever you do have geodesic completeness, you should be fine with stochastic completeness as well. That's sort of my feeling. Um, maybe also for the critical case. Um, and then uh, probably um, you are not stochastically complete the moment uh, you have geodesic completeness. So why right now that would be my guess, that you actually for this particular case have a good match between geodesic completeness and stochastic completeness. But I don't have a theorem yet to back that up. Thank you. Any other question? So maybe I have one uh, about the, the merging of points. So if we look at the, the here, the, the um, yeah, two points, when you collide one point, you're basically going to the one skeleton. So here the question, if I understand well, is do we reach this skeleton? Yep. But then, then this makes a link which is quite interesting for me with stratified spaces because the question is if we can concentrate things on lower dimensional stratum, it yep. means that somehow we may be able to have sparsity or to obtain sparsity. But then the question is what's happening if we continue on that lower dimensional stratum? So here, here there could be, I could see two things. Either we could continue within the lower dimensional stratum and, and yep. be constrained, but maybe there could be also some yeah, Brownian process that could allow to get out at some point again to higher dimensional stratum. So what's your feeling about that? Um, well, I think at that point it kind of becomes a bit artificial on the level of like how do you really link it with the images at the end. So I think it, uh, there are all sorts of different things you can try and probably um, for each one, you may be able to find a good motivation. Because of what you said, basically, you think of these two uh, landmarks colliding, then it's like one particle. But, but it's one particle with the mass of two as well. So it's not yes. exactly the same as but one particle. Yes, yeah, so, so that, that is true. But then obviously the question is, um, find a good reason of why the canonical thing is that they actually continue to move as two particles. So that's kind of like a sticky, Boundary con well, it's not the true sticky boundary condition, but it's kind of once they've collided, they stay together for all times. That would be the situation where you continue moving on this like lower dimensional stratum. Um, but then what we've uh, spoken earlier about this uh, stochastic completion, 
there could also be a good reason of maybe just them separating again. Um, and that may actually be down to what kind of images you care about. So I can think of different uh, situations where uh, maybe you really, at some point if they've collided, you want them to continue for all time because that, or like continue together for all time, because maybe that gives you an additional um, information about the picture or you want them to separate. So I mean, they, they, I think there was once a talk where um, they cared about teeth um, of some animal and they had um, the images of that and they were doing landmark analysis on that and it seemed to work out quite nicely until at some point they realized that there were actually two teeth they identified which really went, um, like they shouldn't have identified. It was more like that one stopped existing and the other one um, just started to be there if you really looked at the evolution. And then this would be like different possibilities arising in your landmark space that maybe sometimes a feature once they have collided in nature, you want them to stick uh, together for all time. Or maybe you then have like a different uh, tooth arising and then you want them to separate again. So I think both is doable. You just would have a good motivation of why you do that. Okay. I think a very, very, very short. <laughs> we have one minute. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, just if, if you look at the diffusion process, I think for two landmarks, then when the distance goes to zero, yep. I think there's a you you can extend your diffusion process by at least by continuity. That's all I checked. But uh, you you could uh, uh, you 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 actually have some kind of process that also continues in in with two landmarks that doesn't work with three. But okay, um, yeah, I mean for the. Um, for this one-dimensional diffusion process, which like characterizes the distance, actually what is quite interesting for the uh, singularities, there are two things you kind of have to be careful about. The first one is if they can collide, and the second one, uh, so this corresponds to entering, say, zero. And then there's also a criterion which tells you if you can leave zero again, which is exactly the question if you can kind of continue. So that's why I wouldn't be uh, surprised, it would, would be linked to that. Um, it doesn't fully uh, link to the same uh, values for gamma uh, because they have different behaviors. But at the end of the day, it's kind of you have better processes and you need to understand for what dimensions you can get out of zero again. Because there are situations where you drift is so strong that any attempt to leave zero is just going to be killed instantly again. So there are actually situations where you cannot leave the singularity again once you hit there. Okay, so maybe we can thank Karen again.